Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today, if I'm a little bit flat, got my sweater on, it's because I've uh, suffering the coronavirus apparently tested positive. So I'm working a few videos that have been in the uh, on the back burner, guys. So if I'm a bit flat, I apologize, but. Uh, it's time to get into it. So today, talking about one of the stocks that I will be uh, that I do hold in the publicly accessible portfolio uh, available on eToro. You can check that out. Link in the description. And it is of course Petróleo Brasileiro, Petrobras. Okay, huge conglomerate um, oil uh, or natural gas producer in Brazil. And we're going to take a look at it today and give my uh, thoughts on it. Disclaimer, of course, nothing said here is financial advice. It's just my opinion, what I'm doing with my money and the money that I manage. You need to seek your own uh, personalized professional advice. And that is not what this is. This is just my opinion, uh, as is everything on this channel. Uh, okay, before we get into it, if you wanted to take this to the next level, there's also the opportunity to join the ROI Club. Okay, ROI Club members get uh, exclusive content, uh, macroeconomic environment analysis, specific stock analysis at least once every month. And these are sometimes off the beaten path. So you, you're unlikely to come across these investment opportunities unless you are an ROI Club member. Now, there's a free membership option, so you can join for free. You get some content, uh, you get access to quite a bit of content. And of course, there's a free trial okay it works out to be 10 bucks a month or five bucks a month if you pay annually okay so it's not expensive to get access to uh some of these um, absolutely incredible investment opportunities i believe to them to be so and you'll get my uh, analyses of them full rundown so that's that link in description uh brief update one page macro normally this doesn't change from one month to the next but this one it has changed quite a lot we've seen oil gapping up and down five to ten dollars uh, if you've seen my most recent podcast with josh young we uh, talk a little bit about why that might be and we also say whether or not that is particularly important for um, long-term value investors which we are Crew dropped down uh, 72.90 as of last week's close, which is just, I mean, it's just insane when you see the amount of inventory draws. China about to reopen, the SBR to uh, release to start to relent, gas to oil switching in Europe and Russian crude, if not coming offline, it's going to be a hell of a lot harder to get uh, our hands uh, on it as a global community. So it's just, it's just uh, mind boggling to see the the gap in price when everything is uh, down when everything appears to be bullish in any case as you're going to see today a lot of the producers haven't dropped as much in price and that's because they're already discounting 50 to 60 dollar oil so whether oil's at 70 dollars or 80 dollars it doesn't really matter too much other than the fact that they are printing cash these factors i mentioned um they're supposedly suppressing price. They're all bullish factors. Okay, they're all continuing to mean that more of the oil supply is being drained without a corresponding increase in capex or companies uh, spending more of what they earn in terms of more production. Uh, almost all the majors are engaging in a shareholder return policy where they're going to be giving most of their free cash uh, outside of maintenance capex back to shareholders. By the way, of dividends and buybacks. Okay, which is key to the thesis as to why the energy sector, particularly hydrocarbons, are, uh, in my mind at least, representing an, a major opportunity. Out of all of these, little question here: um, Which one of these are per is permanent and sustaining in terms of more supply coming onto the market? Russian crude uh, continually flowing onto the market. Uh, I don't think so. SBR release, no, eventually that has to stop. Uh, OPEC cuts or just Mr. Quota, I mean, that's um, going to continue if we see the oil price to drop. OPEC will continue to, to cut their production. Whether that's masking the fact they can't even meet their quotas is another question. China reopening, can China stay closed forever? I don't believe so. There's already uh, strong signs that they are opening. Gas to oil switching in Europe, is that going to be bullish or bearish for the price? I think a reasonable person can come to their own conclusion, uh, conclusions there and re recession fears. Um, maybe there'll be a little bit of a drop in demand on recession in terms of demand growth. Will that last forever? Of course not. Okay. So is the thesis that, thesis that I have and that many people have around the hydrocarbon and oil producers, has it been disrupted or just simply delayed? And I tend to um, lean towards the latter. Let's take a look uh, chart from Nine Point Partners with regards to global inventory. This includes onshore and floatage 
uh, floating storage. As you can see, we are, we're just going lower and lower and lower at the moment. And that's because these particular producers, a lot, many of whom I own, they are not continuing to increase their production. They're keeping their production flat. The free cash that they are earning, they're giving back to shareholders, as I mentioned. This will continue until such a time where the oil price uh, gaps up violently to the upside to such a point where these guys literally have such an incentive to start to develop more of their own acreage uh, and increase their capex away from giving it back to shareholders and back into production. That would be one, if the oil price went through the roof. The other option would be if their share prices in turn due to the buyouts, uh, the buybacks, excuse me, and the dividend payouts were such that their stock price shot through the roof. In which case we as shareholders or me as shareholders at least as a shareholder at least would be extremely happy with either of those two outcomes okay uh it's heads i win tails uh, i win in this scenario okay doesn't mean it happens straight away uh it doesn't mean sentiment can't get in the way in the meantime but those really are the only two scenarios unless you believe that we're going off oil um and gas tomorrow which i think given what we've seen in germany recently given what we've seen around the world this year um we should have a better understanding than that in terms of global energy. This is global inventories versus the four-year average. As you can see, we have never uh, had such a draw against uh, this benchmark of the four-year average. And a good chart here from Crescent Capital, a uh, friend, Tavi Koshta, looking at since 2008 at the peak. And then where we are today, 2022, we've seen the oil price break through uh, that downtrend. And now it's coming back to test the support. So I think this could be a very good opportunity to, um, to increase exposure to oil itself or perhaps to the uh, explorers and producers who have not sold off as much as you would expect given the recent pullback in oil. Normally, if a commodity sells off, the producers sell off more. And if the commodity rises, the, the producers uh, rise even more due to that operational leverage. However, that hasn't been the case, which means that a lot of sen negative sentiment has already been priced into these producers. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at a snapshot, mainly balance sheet focused. So we've got the market cap, shares outstanding, net debt and price to a tangible book value. So you will have heard Josh speak a lot uh, for a good segment in our podcast as to his valuation process and how he thinks about looking to buy things um, at a steep discount to their replacement value, essentially. So at one time's book for a mega cap stock such as Petrobras, it really is quite extraordinary. Uh, and then when we take a look at some of the income metrics here, to buy it at just over two times the EBITDA um, for a company this size, when you're looking at free cash flow over the last 12 months, uh, $36 billion on a current market cap of you know just over twice that. It's uh, less than twice that, excuse me. It's uh, It really is quite phenomenal in terms of an opportunity, in my opinion. Okay, so one page uh, that I've uh, whipped up here for the company the expectations uh, as of 2022, the revenue is $122 billion. I've converted this from Hayao into a USD. And most of it should be reported in USD because they are selling uh, hydrocarbons, oil in particular, which should be priced in USD. So just bear that in mind. EBITDA, 67.5. Um, expected to come in. Free cash, 36.6. Enterprise value 116. Okay, so you've got, uh, according to these particular metrics, you got a, a free cash flow to enterprise value yield of 32%. So taking into account the debt of the company, and you're getting a th nearly a third uh, in free cash flow yield. That's obviously incredible from a, a free cash flow yield, all else being equal. Free cash flow to market cap, of course, when you exclude out in the debt and just simply look at the share price today, what would that mean is a yield, 55% yield. Okay, so whether the stock price goes up or down or whatever, uh, buying a, a dollar worth of the company today should is expected to return you 55 cents uh, via free cash in a year. And then obviously what this particular company chooses to do with that free cash mostly is to give it out as a dividend. So you will have a a very high return of your investment expected based on these metrics and based on the policies, the payout ratio policies of the company. We'll talk about some of the contention around that in a moment. What should the multiple for this type of company be? I think it's, I think it's 
it's not going to trade like a North American company because people are simply scared of Brazil. And so I think that you won't get an eight, uh, six to eight times multiple, but a four suggests a 25% free cash flow yield, which uh, is is certainly not out of the question uh, in my mind. So I could see this re-rating to a, a four times multiple. Here we have the, the shares on issue, the price and the tangible book value as of uh, previous close and the return on equity over the last 12 months. Obviously that looks a lot better than you'd normally expect given the, the year that we had for oil. Now, there are some warts. A lot of this has simply been cut and pasted from the Echo Petrals, uh presentation. Why? Because they're essentially the same narratives and the same fears, just in a different country. So Colombia elected Gustavo Pedro and in Brazil, you had Lula uh, winning the election. They do the same thing. They threaten to nationalize and do all this sort of thing. What you've got to look at is what they can do, not what they say they're going to do. And in the Brazilian House and Senate, there's still a large support for uh, for the uh, right-leaning parties. And as such, Lula already has had to soften his rhetoric in terms of what he can do because most people uh, have just simply called his bluff and said that there's no way what he would like to do in terms of nationalizing Petrobras would even be able to be put past uh, through the House or the Senate. So uh, the rest of this uh, is specific and peculiar to Eco Petrol. But I wish to point out that currently, should Petrobras, uh, should we enter a $50 Brent environment, Petrobras could in theory continue to pay out a double digit dividend yield. I'm going to say that again. In a $50 Brent environment, so the, that would be at least another 30% fall from where we are today, Petrobras can continue to pay out a double digit dividend yield. That to me is a margin of safety that is satisfactory for taking on this jurisdictional risk or perceived jurisdictional risk at, risk at least. And so we need to ignore the rhetoric, focus on the constraints as uh, the great book, Geopolitical Alpha, uh, Marco Papich outlines in that book very, very well. So uh, here we go, constraints. They're, all, they're basically the same, guys. Okay, I, that's why I've just simply cut and paste from uh, Echo Patrol's uh, and presentation because a lot of these simply apply to Petrobras. They're the same thing in, in different wrapping, okay? Uh, sometimes I think it's really good just to step back and make something super simple. So let's look at the reserves that this company has. We know it's trading on a ridiculous cash flow multiple. The market's pricing in that it's going to go out of, or it's going to run out of reserves, go out of business in less than two years. The question is, will it? Are the reserves more than two years? Yes or no? With the addition, uh, this has been taken from uh, Seeking Alpha, with the additions, year-end reserves stood at 9.9 .9 billion barrels of oil or 11 years worth of production at current rate. So if they keep their production at stay flat, they've got 11 years worth of production. We are buying that for less than two years worth. Okay, if we use that similar scenario that I used to value Meg Energy, right? Same deal. What are the reserves? What's the free cash flow yield? So how many years am I buying uh, versus how many years worth of production uh, are there that the company has? 85% of these are accounted for as liquids, 15% as natural gas. And that for me is more interesting because I'm more interested in the oil thesis, although natural gas um, more volatile, and you can have a you can have a swing to the upside as we saw with Dutch TTF this year. Under Brazilian regulatory regulatory framework, reserve volumes stood at 10.3 billion barrels of oil equipment. So that's you know, that that's all uh, consistent there, adding up in terms of giving us confidence as to the amount of reserves that they have. So verdict, I'm going long the stock in the portfolio. Uh, I am trading options on it as well. You can join the options Maverick to learn how I'm doing that. Uh, I'll be building up a position close to 5% of assets under management. Uh, it's big, cheap, dividend paying cash flow behemoth. And I believe the narrative to be worse than reality. We're, we're buying it close to replacement value, if not a slight discount, cyclical cash flow in nature. So we need to watch out for that. And we need to watch for CapEx. If they start to pour out this CapEx and increase production at the same time that lots of other people are doing it in the cycle, uh, then we would need to keep an eye on that because it might signal the beginnings of an oversupplied market. I think we are years away from that happening, but there's something to keep an eye on. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, a reminder to join the ROI Club. Okay, you can test it out for free for seven days. Okay, um, so there's no risk. You get access to my valuations. Uh, you get access to exclusive interviews with the professional investors and all the different intelligence nodes to which I am lucky to have access. So um, look forward to seeing you in there. Jump in, give it a free trial. Um, 
no risk. You don't like it, don't have to pay. Uh, simple as that. Copy the portfolio. It'll be in the description with the link. Hit me up on Twitter. And of course, like and subscribe to the channel. Greatly appreciate all the support, guys. Thank you very much. I'm going to head off and I look forward to seeing you in another video shortly. Cheers. Take care.